The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, hey everyone. The International Federation on Aging and its partners SAGE and EGAL Canada are proud to present the latest webinar in a series addressing inequalities experienced by older LGBTQ2 people. The in International Federation on Aging, also known as IFA, is a non-governmental organization in formal relations with the United Nations and the World Health Organization. It is headquartered in Toronto, Canada, and is a global point of connection of experts and expertise to help influence and shape policies that impact the lives of older adults. The IFA would like to acknowledge the financial support received from Employment and Social Development Canada to deliver a series of three webinars on older LGBTQ2 people. We are happy to present the second of these webinars today discussing the fundamental importance of safe and affordable housing for an aging LGBTQ2 population. This webinar will discuss the experiences of older LGBTQ2 people navigating housing and home care options and the conditions that make them more vulnerable, including that older LGBTQ2 people are more likely to experience poverty, financial instability, stigma and discrimination, which in turn may impact their access to housing possibilities. Just a note, throughout the webinar, participants will be able to submit typed questions through the GoToWebinar platform, and after both panelists have finished speaking, we will take as many questions as we can ensure a robust discussion of this issue. Next slide, please. Here is a brief overview of how we will proceed in today's webinar. We'll go through some introductions of our panelists, review the importance of developing uh, housing and services for LGBTQ2 individuals, um, and then we will have our both of our panelists, Dr. John Ecker and Dr. Andrea Daly, present, and then we'll have a question and answer period. Next slide, please. My name is Kelly Kent. I am the director of SAGE's National LGBT Elder Housing Initiative in the United States, and I will be moderating the webinar today. I have spent the past 20 years working in the affordable housing industry, focused on the intersection of health and housing in community settings. I am excited to be here with you today, moderating today's webinar. Dr. John Ecker is a recent graduate from the PhD program in experimental psychology at the University of Ottawa, where he worked under the supervision of Dr. Tim Aubrey. John's research and evaluation interests include homelessness, housing, community mental health, community integration, and issues related to the LGBTQ community. The second panelist on this webinar is Dr. Andrea Daly. Dr. Daly is associate professor of the faculty in the Faculty of Social Work at York University. Andrea received her BSW and MSW at York University. She brings to the, social, the School of Social Work extensive experience as a mental health clinician within the areas of community mental health and working with consumers uh, and LGBTQ communities. Her research interests include health services access and equity of diversely situated LGBTQ2 populations. Next slide, please. Now to provide some background and context for today's conversation. Next slide, please. SAGE, or Services and Advocacy for LGBT Elders, is the United States' largest and oldest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ2 older adults. Our mission is to lead in addressing issues related to LGBT aging. Next slide. SAGE believes that homes should be our havens and that shelters um, should provide um, safety for those that are LGBTQ to feel safe, especially as we age. Often challenges incurred by LGBT older adults include economic insecurity, housing discrimination, lack of legal protections, and racial and gender disparities. Next slide, please. LGBT older adults are twice as likely to be single. They are three to four times likely to not have children and frequently uh, are estranged from their families of origin. Many lack traditional caregiver support, 
And we find through research that there are greater numbers of health disparities and overall higher economic needs of LGBT older adults. Next slide, please. SAGE uh, began its work largely with the impetus of a 2014 report from the Equal Rights Center that found that 48% of older same-sex couples applying for senior housing in the United States were subjected to some form of discrimination. These findings were substantiated with additional research um, conducted in 2016 by the Williams Institute that found large amounts of socioeconomic disparities as well as health disparities among LGBT older adult populations. In addition, the Urban Institute released a report um, finding similar results this past summer in 2017. Next slide, please. Due to these um, reports and the findings, as well as anecdotal research that we have known for some time, SAGE began in 2015 the National LGBT Elder Housing Initiative. This initiative is focused on five key prongs that interrelate into our work. These include building of LGBT-friendly, multifamily, affordable senior housing, and providing capacity to organizations across the country to um, create these types of models, training providers of mainstream housing and services around LGBT cultural competency, working at the local, state, and federal level um, to advocate uh, for fair housing on the behalf of LGBT older adults, um, educating consumers and providing best practices for consumers around LGBT aging. It, this includes aging in place best practices like home modification and care coordination and expanding services, highlighting new innovative models, including naturally occurring retirement communities, co-housing models and aging in place best practices. Information around the, all of these various prongs in the National LGBT Elder Housing Initiative can be found at www.sageusa.org slash lgbthousing.org. Next slide. In the first year of SAGE's LGBT um, Elder Housing Initiative, we developed a capacity building narrative that really focused on the understanding of affordable housing um, and the development process for LGBT aging providers. We also uh, per developed other webinar um, capacity building resources on the development process, aging in place, and home safety and home modification. We developed um, a developer resource directory to better connect experienced housing developers across the country with LGBT aging service providers. And again, these can all be located on SAGE's housing platform, Welcome Home, at sageusa.org slash LGBT housing. Next slide, please. SAGE's um, training platform on LGBT cultural competency is called SAGE Care. SAGE Care provides LGBT cultural competency training to service providers across the United States. SAGE Care provides the added benefit that participating organizations may receive a national credential highlighting the number of staff trained on cultural competency. There are three different training um, programs within the SAGE Care platform for residential uh, providers, and more information on SAGE Care can be located at sageusa.com. Care. Next slide, please. In addition, SAGE has a number of addi additional tools and resources for consumers and also runs the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging. One of those tools is um, that was newly released this past year is Creating Your Care Plan, an LGBT person's guide to preparing for medical procedures. These, uh, this is available in different languages. It has worksheets and is a valuable tool for LGBT older adults. This can be uh, located at lgbtagingcenter.org. Next slide, please. For further questions, um, uh, participants are welcome to reach out at any point. Um, and 
with that, um, I'm now going to introduce Dr. John Ecker, and he will be discussing unique needs of older LGBTQ2 people in regards to Canadian homelessness. John? Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kelly. It actually you addressed a lot of points that I'll be talking about as well, so that's uh, fantastic. And welcome to all of you out there. I'm really excited to talk about some of this research. So as uh, Kelly mentioned, I'll be talking about LGBTQ2S older adult homelessness. Um, so just a bit of background on the topic. What do we know about LGBTQ2S adults who experience homelessness? Not that much. We know, um, and probably a lot of you out there know, that um, LGBTQ2S youth are overrepresented among individuals who experience homelessness. The stats range, but it's about 20 to 40 percent of youth who experience homelessness identify as LGBTQ2S. Adults, it's still too early to tell. We don't really have a lot of information on that yet. However, encouragingly, there are um, some measures being taken to really address that. So um, there's some efforts being done across Canada right now. They're called point in time counts. Essentially, it's homeless enumeration efforts. So counting uh, the number of individuals experiencing homelessness in your community. A few counts have uh, been conducted over the past few years. And that research has found that anywhere from about 5% of individuals to 14% of individuals, of adults who experience homelessness, identify as part of the LGBTQ2S community. In uh, the United States, in San Francisco, that number is 30%. So there are some information coming out right now. And just to um, provide just a general overview of homelessness among older adults. So uh, the Canadian government released a study in 2015 2016, looking at um, the rate of homelessness among older adults. And what they found was that 50, um, the percentage of older adults between 50 and 60 years of age increased from 12% of all shelter users in 2005 to 21% in 2014. So this, you're seeing a really large um, increase in the number of older adults experiencing homelessness. So it's something to really keep on folks' radar. And with this new information coming, uh, we will be able to kind of contextualize that number even more in terms of the number of LGBTQ2S adults who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so related to Kelly's points um, earlier, just some of the links into homelessness among older LGBTQ2S adults. Um, so things like family rejection, um, mental health and substance use challenges, income disparities. Um, oh, there's a bit of an echo. Um, Income disparities due to homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, racism, housing discrimination due to homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, and racism, social, social isolation as well. That's something that's come out in the literature quite a bit with older adults, older LGBTQ2S adults who've experienced homelessness. So they're finding that they just don't have as many social supports. There was actually an interesting study conducted by the Ottawa Senior Pride Network. Uh, they did a housing survey back in 2015, and what they found that is that LGBTQ2S older adults are more likely to be in a lower income bracket, earning um, so with 35% of LGBTQ2S older adults earning less than $40,000 a year. So we can see that LGBTQ2S older adults may actually be um, at risk of greater poverty as well. So those are just some of the um, things related, poten potential pathways into homelessness among LGBTQ2S older adults. In terms of service use experiences, what do we know about that? So we know that LGBTQ2S older adults who have experienced homelessness tend to be higher utilizers of health and social services than non-LGBTQ2S adults who have experienced homelessness. So that's an interesting finding. So we know that folks are accessing the systems. However, what does that access look like? So positive service use experiences are characterized by staff who identified as LGBTQ2S themselves and or who were knowledgeable on issues relevant to the community. This is particularly important for transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. However, there are a lot of uh, discussions of negative service use experiences, including feelings of stigma, and this resulted in some folks actually avoiding services altogether. Uh, we don't know a lot about uh, current experiences in the homelessness system, but what we do know from the youth literature is that LGBTQ2S youth experiencing homelessness um, encounter homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia from other residents and even some staff members as well. So exiting out of homelessness, we don't really know a whole lot. 
I think Kelly uh, referred to this before, but we do know that um, discrimination occurs with landlords. So LGB couples have greater trouble setting up apartment viewings than non-LGB couples uh, research has found. So it's just something to think about, just the intersection of all these different things when it comes to combating um, LGBTQ2S homelessness among older adults. So that's a bit of a background. So given that there's not much, clearly there's a need for more research. And this is where I kind of step in. So I was involved in two projects, once um, as an independent researcher in 2015, and once again, uh, just last year in 2017. Uh, both projects focused on LGBTQ2S adults who have experienced homelessness. They had to be over eight, the age of 18, but we did find that um, the average age of our sample was about in the late 40s. So it was a diverse group of folks. I'll be talking about both interchangeably, but mostly about the adult housing needs assessment we conducted last year. So this is a project co-initiated by um, an executive director from a nonprofit housing agency in Ottawa, Alice Kubitschek, and it received funding from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So with the adult housing needs assessment, uh, we did three uh, separate kinds of data collection. So in the first study, we just looked at LGBTQS um, adults, but in this study, we expanded that to including service providers in the mix because we knew that service provision was something that uh, was potentially volatile for LGBTQ2S adults and older adults as well. So we did individual interviews of 22 adults in Ottawa who identified as LGBTQ2S and who had experienced at least one episode of homelessness as an adult. And as I said, we also did some um, it, uh, research with staff members across homeless, general homeless serving agencies in Ottawa. So we conducted four focus groups with those uh, program staff members, as well as an online survey that was open to anyone working in the homelessness sector. So what did the, our participants, what did the uh, demographic breakdown look like? So we had um, 11 individuals identified as cisgender male, five identified as cisgender female, three identified as transgender female, one identified as a transgender male, one identified as two-spirit, and one identified as agender or bigender. In terms of their sexual identity, 11 identified as bisexual, six identified as gay, two identified as lesbian, one identified as two-spirit, one identified as heterosexual, and one identified on the spectrum between pansexual and asexual. So looking at the um, current living situations, about half were living in an emergency shelter, six were living in private market apartment, two were couch surfing, two on the street, one was staying with family, one in detox, and one in a motel. The ages range from 19 to 68, with the average age being 39. Um, I think about a quarter of our participants were over the age of 50, so there was um, a large representation of folks, of older adults in the mix. Um, you'll see the other, um, the racial and eth um, eth ethnic background of folks, as well as their employment um, in the past 12 months as well. All right, so just getting into the results, I'm cognizant of time. I'm going to speak for about another four minutes. Um, in terms of their histories of homelessness, actually half of the participants had an experience of homelessness prior to the age of 21. So that's really, um, really signifies that we need to focus on preventative measure, measures, right, early, so ensure that um, adult, adult LGBTQ2S adults aren't um, you know, at risk of homelessness as well. Um, just what's contributing to their entries into homelessness? So financial insecurity, substance use, uh, mental health challenges, and also relationship breakdowns. Or, um, and the, the um, interconnectivity of those things too really contributed to folks' homelessness. And, uh, and a, a person's LGBTQS identity did impact their entry into homelessness. So it impacted things like landlord discrimination, harassment from other tenants, and struggles with their gender identity and or sexual orientation, which often resulted in uh, some mental health challenges or uh, substance use. So as you can see, just a couple of quotes on the slide. I'll, I'll read one out. I was living with homophobia and AIDS phobia from my neighbors, and for about a year, I was trying to get that taken care of through the landlord and with the police, and at the end of it all, nothing was happening. Nothing was changing, and I was going absolutely bananas, and I was in a huge depression. So really just thinking about the impact of homophobia and AIDS phobia in this case in a person's um, housing, just the huge impact of that. Um, their service use experiences. So, Participants generally felt uh, supported by staff members. However, there were some uh, interactions with staff that were homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic. And some participants just didn't feel comfortable disclosing their gender, gender identity and or sexual orientation with staff. However, it did appear that older adults were more likely to be open with their sexuality, which is an interesting finding. 
In terms of interacting with other clients of these services, many of the, of the participants did not feel safe to close it disclosing their gender identity and or sexual orientation with other clients. And this, is, this discomfort arose from fear of verbal and physical harassment from other clients. There were participants who were open to their gender identity and sexual orientation as well. However, a lot of these participants did recount experiences of verbal harassment, <coughs> older adults in particular. Um, in terms of their housing experiences, some participants felt safe while others did experience harassment from other tenants as well. One interesting finding too, uh, older adults often had this sense of advocacy when speaking about their role in the LGBTQ2S community. So folks felt like they were, you know, just really, it was, they had a, it was not the right, but they had kind of this um, compelling feeling of just really advocating for the LGBTQ2S community based upon their previous experiences, right? There was a real sense of advocacy, which was a fantastic thing to see. Um, I'll just skip this slide for the sake of time and that one too, unfortunately. These slides will be available though, so feel free to uh, check out the skip slides um, after the webinar. So just in terms of the housing needs, so we did ask, you know, what kind of housing would you want as an LGBTQ2S adult? It was diverse. There wasn't one concrete answer that folks provided. Half of the participants stated that they would access housing specific to the LGBTQ2S community. This would fill a void currently in Ottawa. It would also provide a safe alternative to mainstream housing. Um, however, a lot of people did want to live independently, right? So there was a sense that I want to live in a building with all sorts of folks in my own apartment. So not necessarily <coughs> one targeted to the LGBTQ2S community. Uh, there is talk too about inter intergenerational living environments. So having both older adults, um, youth, you're having like a real mix of folks to really learn from one another. Um, yeah, so, so that was a really interesting finding as well. Um, just some other housing considerations to speak of. Some participants expressed that housing options specific to certain identities and orientations within the LGBTQ2S spectrum are warranted, in particular for trans and gender non-binary individuals. They thought that it could be a really great support system for folks to have uh, housing exclusive to that community. Uh, they also thought that support should be attached to ha house any kind of housing that's developed and allow for LGBTQ2S individuals to support one another. So having that pure support component was vital. Um, neighborhoods are important as well. People need to feel <coughs> safe where they're living. Social opportunity is important as well. Going back to my, one of my original points, um, social, social isolation is something that was referenced uh, by some of the older LGBTQ2S adults. So ensuring that there's social opportunities for folks is super important as well. And the staff of the housing should ideally identify with or identify as LGBTQ2S themselves just to have that shared kind of knowledge and experience. So um, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to pass on the staff stuff, which is really interesting. I would recommend checking it out. And I, there is a re public report available that I can share the slides or share that with individuals as well. I'm just going to go over some of the recommendations and then that'll be my piece. So just some of the recommendations that we developed, develop housing that meets the needs of LGBTQ2S individuals, ensure that in LGBTQ2S individuals are at the forefront of its development, having staff that identify as LGBTQ2S, uh, a lot of supports out there, social supports, and ensure that older adults are supported. Um, working with landlords too is something really important because we uh, mentioned before that discrimination occurs with landlords, right? So providing some training opportunities is a really important uh, feature as well. Um, and I think one other thing I'll emphasize is protects the rights of transgender, gender nonconforming, and two-spirit individuals. So this is something that came up time and time again, and we really just need to ensure that there are, uh, their rights are entrenched in the system. So when they access the shelter, they feel comfortable, supported, and able to access uh, services that really um, align with their gender identity, right? That's just crucial, crucial, crucial stuff. Um, so I think I'll end there for the sake of time. I, I do apologize to Andrea. I feel like I may have gone a bit over, but uh, thank you all for listening and I look forward to your questions. And yeah, my contact information is just there. Great, thanks. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Andrea Daly will now continue this discussion and will discuss her research in serv on service providers and home care for older LGBTQ2 individuals. Andrea? Thanks, Kelly, and uh, thanks, John. No problem. I think we all have a lot to say and not enough time to say it. But, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining today's webinar. Um, 
what I wanted to do today is report on some key findings of an Ontario-based study of home care access experiences of older LGBTQ2 communities. And this is a project that deliberately included a subsample of participants aged 60 years and older. So I'm really gonna, I'm gonna be focusing uh, on the findings from this subset of, uh, of participants. And what I wanna do is uh, focus on the ways in which resistance and resiliency manifest in the lives of LGBTQ2 older adults during their telling of their home care access experiences. Um, uh, and if I have time, I want to speak a little bit to an access and equity framework that we developed as an outcome of this project and how the findings from this subsample of participants uh, helped us revise it to think about how we incorporate resistance and resilience as an integral consideration of home care access and equ uh, equ equity. Uh, so we can just stay on this slide for now. Uh, the project uh, that I'm going to talk about today is part of a, a larger research program that began in 2009. Uh, we did a number of uh, preliminary projects which are listed on this slide and there are references there as well. Uh, so you can read about that. I'm not going to go through each one individually. The last link at the bottom will take you to the project website where you can access uh, all the articles and materials from the project. But essentially what we were trying to do is to get um, a, a better sense of the landscape of uh, home care in relation to LGBTQ2 communities. Um, I began this work in collaboration with Judy McDonnell from the School of Nursing at York University and in partnership with Rainbow Health Ontario and the Toronto Central Community Care Access Centre. And then in 2011, we expanded the team with the addition of co-investigators Melissa St. Pierre, Jerry Brotman from McGill and Jane Arison from uh, McMaster University to complete a four-year CIHR funded project. Uh, next slide. So there is a research that um, helps us to understand, of course, how um, uh, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and cis sexism contribute to health services barriers for LGBTQ2 communities. I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail. Um, it's on the slide and the references are there if you want to um, search this out uh, in more detail. But um, we, we know that from the existing research, the health issues facing older LGBTQ people are exacerbated by lifelong exposure to homophobia, biphobia, and transphobic discrimination. Yet uh, this population remains considerably underrepresented in the mainstream healthcare system. We know that there are gaps in professional education about LGBTQ2 older people. Um, and that, excuse me, experiences of heterosexism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia and cis sexism have been identified as key dynamics in the availability of and access to relevant services. Uh, we also know that um, health, research with healthcare providers indicate that they lack awareness of the holistic health issues faced by older sexual and gender minority people and that they often state that they've actually never worked with older people who identify as queer. Um, as a result um, of this provider lack of awareness, uh, LGBTQ older people express concerns about accessing services ranging from um, concerns about overt experiences of discrimination and violence to concerns about invisibility and erasure to fears of disclosing their queer identities. It also means that um, they may often not disclose um, identities of same-sex partners or other people who may be very uh, important in terms of understanding their health and their health needs. Um, I just wanna to speak to the issue of invisibility of diversity in this body of research um, uh, and the fact that there is a lack of diversity in terms of understanding uh, the, the sort of the range of experiences within LGBTQ2 communities uh, in relation to both aging and health. So for example, transgender, bisexual people, people of color, and those living with disabilities and with limited social privilege, such as privileges of citizenship, um, are unlikely to be represented in current research. Um, researchers note that incremental change in favor of LGBTQ2 people has advantaged those who already benefit from at least some social privilege related to race, class, gender, age, citizenship. So we really need to think about these interlocking social, uh, interlocking social privileges and oppressions as important considerations when examining older LGBTQ2 people's access to health services. 
Um, yes, sorry, that's next slide and next slide. So just moving on to the home care piece, there's been very little written about the home care context for LGBTQ communities. Um, the available literature does indicate that there are unique concerns about providing care in the home for sexual and gender minority older adults. Um, old, they've expressed fears of having to hide books, pictures, and other indicators of their sexual orientation and or gender identity in their homes in order to avoid discrimination by home care providers. You know, remembering that this is a very often a very private context, unlike public institutions. Uh, when a provider comes into somebody's home, there are no witnesses um, to the interaction. Um, and this is important uh, because we know that those who experienced oppression in their younger lives, um, that the home was often a space, I think uh, Kelly spoke to this earlier, where they could live out identities and relationships and safety and security. So requiring home care services often means that they're jeopardizing this private space. So the project then that we did um, is based on really the, the lack of empirical evidence around home care experiences for LGBTQ communities. And it was a multi-pronged project, community-based and uh, provincial uh, project that included LGBTQ to service users, home care service providers, and administrators. So there's just a sort of a, a look there about uh, in terms of who we talk to and how we talk to them. Um, so next slide. In terms of characterizing the older LGBTQ2 participants, I want to note that when compared to the young old, which we might consider uh, uh, being in the age range of 60 to 69, there were fewer middle old, which might be between the age of 70 to 79, and even fewer old old, which would be 80 years of age and older. Uh, so this is one limitation of our research. Um, the majority of respondents self-identified as white, male or female and gay or lesbian. So again, I talked about the invisibility of diversity in health services uh, access research. And um, for this sub sample, I, I think we didn't make much headway in that regard, but I think the, the larger sample we did. Um, as uh, both uh, John and uh, Kelly spoke to, the household incomes um, were quite low with just over 40% earning um, under $20,000 annually. Um, and all but two of the 25 older participants received formal home care services. So we were, we were also looking at informal services in this project. The 12 participants who completed in the survey um, sorry, in interviews have uh, background, care, background characteristics that are nearly identical to those who uh, completed the survey, the 25 that completed the survey. So next slide. <clears throat> so the key findings of our research echo themes reported in the existing LGBTQ2 health services literature with the inability to anticipate affirmative care, strategies for self-disclosure of self and same-sex partners, and recommendations for service provider focused training and education related to LGBTQ2 communities. Uh, this is uh, one um, participant with um, uh, who had identified as trans who talked about the issue of health cards and documentation that uh, inaccurately reflected um, her gender identity and expression. Next slide. And this is just an example of a uh, a woman who talked about um, uh, participants reaction to her when she disclosed that um, her partner was in the kitchen. So disclosed that she was lesbian. So sort of a physical jumping back and a verbal gasp uh, at hearing that. Um, so we did hear of these stories. What I wanted to focus on today were really uh, the next, yeah, thank you, uh, were the um, stories we heard that disrupted discourses. Um, it's not that the other stories we heard aren't important, of course, to enhancing access to higher quality home care for LGBTQ2 older adults, but we really feel that the contributing strength of our research rests in findings that disrupt, disrupt the characterization of LGBTQ2 older adults as passive recipients of systemic discrimination and stigma and um, those who fear disclosure during their healthcare interactions. So our analysis of the interviews identified narratives that signaled agency with respect to enacting resistance and resiliency 
in the context of the anticipation of, and at times in response to systemic oppression. Um, and these really are found in three interrelated practices, affirming declarations of sexual identities, centering past and present activism, and embeddedness in, in care communities. So I'm gonna go through each of these uh, very briefly and probably very quickly. Um, so of the 25 participants that completed the survey, 17 indicated that their home care service providers knew of their sexual orientation, while others indicated that their service providers either didn't know or they weren't sure whether their providers knew. Uh, 12 participants indicated that they told providers during care interactions. Participants' descriptions of interactions, um, yeah, if you can stay there for a bit. Nope, next, previous slide, yes, thank you. Participants' descriptions of interactions with service providers illustrate the various ways they made affirming declarations of sexual identities rather than being closeted, closeted by uh, anticipated homophobia and lesbophobia. While some participants described self-disclosing in direct and, ex and explicit manners to service providers, others described less verbal and more demonstrative affirmations of their sexual identity. And we can see this described by Sylvia in the first quote where she talks about coming home and hugging and kissing her partner. Um, so not saying so much in words, but um, demonstrating their relationship uh, through this behavior. Um, uh, and suggesting that in doing this, there, were, there was no hiding, there were no pretenses, that they were being who they, who they were. Uh, so the metaphor of not hiding was used by several participants to convey a commitment to affirming declarations of their sexual orientation and or same-sex relationships as normative, and therefore self-disclosure during care interactions as natural and a non-event. In terms of the second uh, quote there, other participants emphasized the unique place of home with respect to hiding. So, um, you know, owning the, the place of home as a place where people can be who, who they are. Participants also described natural yet affirming declarations of sexual identity um, that relied upon the use of homonormative language, such as a gay man referring to his husband when speaking to a service provider, while quote unquote, never really making an announcement. Um, and finally, it's important to note that participants negotiated these affirmative declarations in their homes many times with, with multiple home care service providers, uh, as this uh, last quote suggests, so that you had nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists going in from different agencies um, to provide care. Uh, so there was these, this continuing, continuing act of um, affirmative declarations. Next slide. Closely related to participants' affirmative declarations of sexual identity was their identification as community activists and or with the discrimination and harms that fueled the lesbian and gay rights movement of past decades. And um, John spoke to this in terms of the, his older participants feeling it was their role to advocate for LGBTQ communities. Um, in their narratives of home care access, participants described disclosing vis-a-vis -vis the centering of past and or present participation in queer movements. So these disclosures locate the lives of LGBTQ2 older adults within the macro context of political recognition and representation. Um, so often participants' narratives of home care access included references to earlier, earlier struggles related to activism coming out and legal rec recognition. A one participant who decided to become involved in the project for the purpose of honoring her deceased partner told of how her partner's history of being confronted with the violence of lesbophobic discrimination in the workplace um, in earlier years sort of butched her up and that uh, with her health, uh, the participant said, I think that by the time she figured out if she was going to die, she was going to die a lesbian. Um, and then other participants um, talked about LGBTQ related activism um, as it was manifest in statements which equated being out of the closet as a human right. And this is what this last uh, quote uh, indicates. And then the final interrelated practice is embeddedness in care communities. Um, so as a potential indicator of participants involvement as activists and or relationships with communities of queer people, most describe their home care access experiences as including informal communities of care, typically involving queer friends or chosen families, and to a lesser extent, their biological families. Um, so this first, for Kathy talks about having friends come in and take meals and, um, you know, having half a dozen friends that come and went 
uh, throughout uh, her, her illness. Uh, for others, their community care was a part of a broader commitment to radical politics that emphasized the building of community. Um, as this last quote uh, suggests, um, Bill says, I, start, I started a living community for social activists when I, when I was teaching at the university. So I lived with 10 other people and we shared cooking and social activism. So that's just a part of me. So it's part of his activist life that he's brought into his home care experience. So as suggested above, uh, informal care communities were often characterized by participants as integral to supporting them through points of crisis. I just want to move to a few concluding thoughts here. Uh, next slide. Oh, I, yeah, we'll skip that slide. Um, So conceivably, these excerpts suggest that participants' affirmative declarations of sexual identities, as described above, are located within the context of their lifelong activism in relationships with LGBTQ2 communities. The healthcare system generally and home care sector specifically is yet another space where they act autonomously, deciding to assert and affirm who they are through a politicized lens of recognition and representation with respect to their right to access high quality care. So their accounts of affirmative declarations within the described context of past and present activism and embeddedness in care communities signal their resistance to and resiliency in the face of experienced and anticipated denial and discrimination. Combined, these themes point to intentionality and a politicized stance on not hiding and the demand to matter as LGBTQ older adults. Um, and let's say, if you can stay on this slide, uh, for many of the LGBTQ2 older adults who live alone, especially those who represent the oldest cohort and persons with a disability, um, who have limited social networks, the risk of isolation and thus negative outcomes is, is, is exacerbated. And I think uh, John spoke a bit about this in his presentation. Uh, the reality of social isolation among this group of people has been described as a function of social and historical discrimination which resulted in more limited and ruptured interactions with biological families. Of the tremendous losses that occurred during the early years of HIV AIDS pandemic and of the generalized ageism within uh, queer communities. However, I think what our research wants to underscore is that although it's important to take social isol isolation into account, we have to be careful not to over-exaggerate the reality of loneliness amongst LGBTQ2 uh, adults. And the extent of this problem, the exaggeration of the reality of loneliness, is often conflated by the lack of recognition of fictive, fictive kin networks made up of close friends. Um, alternative support systems, such as intergenerational friendships and community networks, reflect unique commitments within LGBTQ2 communities that are often unavailable to heterosexual older adults. And they're also invisible to health and social service agencies. Um, I have a few other points here about, um, you know, while we make this argument, we're also cautious to suggest that not everybody has access to these practices. Uh, thinking about trans people who may experience uh, disproportionate um, discrimination in the form of ridicule, rejection, and hostility by healthcare providers. Um, and also recognizing that there are different experiences um, among older LGBTQ to populations based on uh, whether they're boomers or silent generations uh, in terms of um, being able to engage in activism around issues of aging. So I, I think I'll leave it there. I have a couple more slides that talk about the access and equity framework, but I, I think if you read through that, those slides, they're fairly uh, self-explanatory. Um, if you can just flip to uh, above, above, yes, no, yeah. Uh, no, nope, right there for electronic and hard copies. Um, you can get access to the the framework and um, and other materials related to the project. Sorry for extending beyond my time. Thank you so much, Andrea. We really appreciate it. Um, again, uh, it's now time for question and answer. Um, feel free to submit typed questions through the GoToWebinar platform, and it should be on the right of your screen where you can type directly into the GoToWebinar platform any questions that you have. Um, and I will um, offer those up to John and Andrea. Um, 
the first question that I would like to pose to both of you is um, through your research, um, were there any LGBTQ2S uh, individuals surveyed um, that identified issues around dementia and other health challenges that created um, unique or additional challenges um, that uh, providers should consider? And um, there were actually two questions about this. Um, it, the the second question is very much tied to the first, but um, in addition, um, what services are available to older um, trans persons that are no longer able to cognitively be aware um, of and maintain their identity? Sure, J John. Do you want to start, or um, you know what I? I that issue didn't come up during my research. We didn't ask about health conditions and that didn't really come up organically. So I would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can talk sort of very briefly about um, a, a story that a participant talked to me about. She was participating to talk about her own experiences of home care, but she also talked about her experience of being a caregiver to an older gay man. This isn't uh, trans specific. Um, but it's, I think, one of the few stories that came up around dementia. Um, and she talked about um, how care, the care providers, the personal support workers that were coming in, um, <clears throat> were, <clears throat> excuse me, who are women, <clears throat> were quite flirtatious with him. He wasn't out um, to the providers, uh, but in dealing with him were, I guess, infantilizing him in some ways and and were being, uh, you know, sort of playful, flirtatious with him in, in the provision of care, which <clears throat> I think we do see that in long-term care homes um, and, and, and other spaces. Um, and his reaction was, as they, the home care service provider organization characterized, it was, was seen as quite aggressive. Um, and he was accusing the personal support workers of, of stealing things from him. And this participant's interpretation of, of that situation was that, in fact, because of the dementia, he wasn't able to articulate um, his sexual identity, his um, and, and his life, you know, in a way that represented it in the way that he wanted to. And then, in fact, his representation or his his sort of accusations around people stealing things was kind of metaphorical, right, in terms of not feeling as though he was well, not being experienced for who he was in that moment. Um, she did intervene uh, in, in terms of being a care provider for him, but she felt that uh, his his response to the to the personal support workers' behavior towards him was was really an expression of um, you know resisting the, what he felt was heterosexism and sort of homophobic treatment uh, during his care. So that, that's one example. Um, it, in terms of our project, sort of more broadly moving away from the older uh, subsample, um, what we found is that trans people were overall less likely to use formal home care. Um, concerns about uh, discrimination, harm, violence um, were, were talked about. Uh, we talked to trans people who are involved more in informal care circles. Um, and their reluctance to really want to get involved in formalized care through uh, existing agencies and organizations. Um, so one of uh, the outcomes of the project is really an urgent call to improve uh, home care services um, for home care service provider organizations to start engaging um, thoroughly with LGBTQ communities, in particular uh, trans activist communities, in, in terms of thinking about how services can be offered and addressing the transphobic uh, transphobia that's kind of inherent in the organizations. Great, Great. thank you. Thank you. Um, a second question. Uh, one of the participants asked, um, do you have any plans to look into rural housing settings where experiences of stigma may be greater and more difficult to escape from? Mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. Um, not yet. I know that did come up in the interpretation of the data that we collected. One of We had an advisory committee of folks who are part of the LGBTQ2S community as well as allies. And there was this um, uh, suggestion brought forward that we do expand this research, right, to focus on non-urban settings because it's such, such a vital and under-researched area, particularly in homelessness in general, right? So I think that's a fantastic next step. Um, and something that I will definitely, we are, we should all definitely consider given as mentioned in the question, the context is just so different and the supports required will definitely be different as well. So I um, will definitely echo that there more needs to be more research on that. Um, at the time <laughs> being, there's uh, not yet, but hopefully forthcoming. Yeah, I just uh, in terms of the home care project, 12% uh, of the participants uh, who completed our survey, uh, which I think were, were 115 participants, 12% of those lived in rural communities uh, across Ontario, um, sort of in the west west of uh, Toronto and north north of Toronto. Um, and we did hear um, from their experiences uh, both good and bad interactions with the healthcare system, but. I think what we heard very clearly in regards to the rural context is um, the informal networks of support, um, either with other rural LGBTQ identified people and or allies. Um, but I do think, um, you know, the way home care is delivered in, rural, in the rural context, uh, is especially the North, may not be through larger home care organizations, but through individual providers who have contracts with, um, well, right now, I guess it would be the Lynn in Ontario. Uh, so it requires a different kind of attention um, to this idea of training and education. Great. Um, if you, I think you each both spoke to this um, in your presentations. This was one of the very first questions that came in, but um, if either of you or both of you would like to comment any further around individuals going back into the closet um, when experiencing homelessness or, or engaging in home care um, for older uh, LGBTQ2 uh, individuals, if there are any uh, additional thoughts you wanted to share about that process. I know you both commented on it in your presentations, but. I'll let John, do you want to go ahead? Sure, yeah, um, just briefly. A couple of our participants did, they were currently in relationships in the shelter system and they were not open with that for fear that they would actually um, be separated um, from each other. So there was, there was definitely an impact of that because they did want to, they did want to live together, right? Which makes absolute, like makes complete sense. So I think that's at the policy level, that's something that needs to be addressed and that's something that's not being addressed as well. Um, that, you know, what couples do exist within the homelessness uh, sector, right? So I think just being cognizant of that and really just addressing it and not shying away from it is something that is vital um, as well. And yeah, as I alluded to earlier, to just the internal internalized homophobia that's and biphobia and transphobia that's occurring as a result of just being present in environments that are uh, you're witnessing verbal harassment, even physical harassment as well, right? That's really going to impact um, your how you access services, which may also limit your chance of accessing needed services like housing, um, speaking with a housing worker. So I think that, yeah, it's such a such an important piece that really needs to be reinforced throughout all of these discussions. Um, <clears throat> what we heard, uh, what I not so much no, not so much about going back into the closet, but this sort of careful negotiation about when when to be out and when not to be out, um, and this depended on at times the individual home care service provider, uh, not necessarily in terms of what that provider might have been conveying in terms of acceptance and affirmation, but in their roles. So, for example, one older gay man talked about. You know where he's more likely to disclose to a provider that he has a more intimate relationship with. So, um, somebody who is 
providing more intimate care, for example, perhaps being bathed or these sorts of things. But then on the other hand, another uh, participant talked about kind of the labor that's involved in being ill at home. And so, for example, when a personal support worker comes in to give to give her a bath, it's it's physically demanding. And she doesn't have sort of the, the energy or the time to be able to develop a relationship with a, with a service provider. Um, so being less likely to sort of disclose in, in that context. Um, so I suppose the idea of being in or out of the closet is a fluctuating one. It's, you know, in the home care context. Great. And um, in terms of the, the next question is, um, are there different dynamics um, to be considered when it is an informal caregiver um, in a relationship with an LGBTQ to as um, individual? Did you find any um, variables that were uh, differentiating in your research? Sure. I, it, I, yeah, I'm not completely sure uh, what's being asked. Um, but, it's, it's, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But I, I will say, um, you know, some of the conversations we had, particularly with younger queer people um, who spoke about sort of interlocking oppressions and, you know, the the concern of not just experiencing homophobia th through care interactions, but also racism and classism. Um, and that having the ability to create their own informal care circle um, was really important in that regard. Um, so, so I'm not sure if, I mean, I guess in terms of thinking about dynamics, for me that sort of raises policy questions about how much control people have mm -hmm. over their care, quote unquote, teams or, or care circles, whether there are funds available for, for people to, to hire their own, uh, you know, whether that's informal or formal. Uh, but in fact, just having more control over decisions related to who provides their care. Great. Um, there was a question around uh, the phenomenon of co-housing models. Do you have any thoughts uh, regarding the movement of, you know, uh, older adults choosing to co cohabitate and share certain housing aspects to facilitate aging in place um, in relation to the LGBTQ2 community? Um, yeah, I'll, I, I think it's a it's an interesting idea and one that came up not necessarily in interviews, but in um, for my research, but um, in interpretation of the interviews amongst different stakeholders in the room. So housing developer or not developers, but housing providers, as well as uh, service providers as well. They thought it could be an interesting, um, really a, a learning opportunity for both young people and older adults to really share that knowledge i think uh, for younger people there's not always that um that knowledge of just kind of what happened with the lgbtq2s um development of rights right like there's just so much that needs to be shared and what better source than from um an older person who may have lived that right so i think that was something that really interesting that came out and it'd be really fascinating to take a, a, a bigger look at that great Mm -hmm. Yeah, sim similarly, I think, you know, there's conversation about the idea of sort of collective collective housing, right, um, or or care cluster housing or or the, sort of that idea where, you know, you have agencies and organizations that are able to provide affirming, safe uh, care to LGBTQ2 communities um, working with sort of specific geographies, I suppose, of housing um, or communities. Um, so that, yeah, that was that was one of the recommendations that sort of came up repeatedly when we were talking to uh, participants about, um, you know, what they would envision as um, high quality care uh, in the home. Great. Great. Um, one last question. 
final question and then we'll wrap up. But um, based on each of your research, what do you each see the trajectory or what's on the horizon um, in response to this kind of research um, for LGBTQ2S populations um, in housing settings, whether it be homelessness or older adults in home care settings? Go ahead, Andrea. That's a big question. <laughs> Would you just mind repeating that, Kelly? Sorry. Um, based on your research, um, you know, what do you kind of uh, see uh, as the trajectory or what's on the horizon um, from either a policy or programmatic um, uh, intervention standpoint to uh, combat these issues? Right. Well, so I think a couple of things um, that have come out of our our project, and if if people have a chance to go through the slides and look at the access and equity framework, so it's a framework that really we developed out of a review or a synthesis of existing access and equity uh, health services literature, and it identifies six components, um, and each component has a number of prompts that agencies and organizations can use to sort of assess the, their accessibility to LGBTQ communities. So I I. I mean, I think one of the things that has come out of this project is a desire to be able to implement this in some kind of way, whether that, you know, as a pilot, as a pilot project. Um, because if you look at the access and equity frameworks that are in in the literature, they're really not addressing LGBTQ uh, communities, uh, particularly older LGBTQ2 communities. Um, so. I mean, that's, I think, one of the things that we'd like to carry forward. I also think the project really calls for um, some accountability uh, in professional health programs, um, you know, in an Ontario context, the Ministry of Health, around the education and training of, of health care providers generally. I, but, you know, this is focused more specifically on home care providers. But, you know, when we surveyed our, the home care providers, 90 percent had never uh, had access or been exposed to LGBTQ2 specific education or training. Personal support workers who provide the bulk of the service or, or support in home care rarely have access to this kind of training and education. Great. Okay, well, um, thank you again to our panelists and to our webinar participants. This webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to the IFA website as well as emailed out to participants. Stay tuned for information about our next webinar, which will be taking place in early April. If you have any questions, please contact Hannah Girdler. Her email is on the screen. And for more information on IFA's older LGBTQ2 uh, people initiatives. But for now, I um, just want to thank again Dr. John Ecker and Dr. Andrea Daly for their time and their um, very educational insights on this very important work. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.